Herzlich willkommen, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Welcome to a special night at Kino International. We are happy you made it through the rain and the cold to make sense of the digital society. It's a night to listen. It's a night to think about the world we live in, to be more precise, the digital world we live in. And it's a night to talk about it. So by the way, hashtag digital society. And we are going to do all three things tonight. I'm Miriam, I'm nice to meet you, although I can't see you very clearly. And I'll be the moderator for the next two hours. This night is not a singular event, but it's a whole starting point for a series that will take place over the year 2018. And it's a series that is hosted by two institutions. One comes from the side of scientific research, and the other one tackles citizenship education. So as a first start for tonight, we'll have a short introduction talk for the lecture and for the series by our two hosts. So please welcome with me Mrs. Hofmann and Mrs. Grüne on stage. So these are the people sitting on their couch and watching us via live stream. So we just say hi for a moment. <laughs> Who are these two ladies? This is uh, Jeanette Hofmann. She is research director at the HIC, the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, short the Humboldt Institute. And this one is Petra Grüne, head of uh, the event department at BPB, which means Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung, as many of you know. And in English, I learned a new expression that's the German Federal Agency for Civic Education. Thanks for being here. Mrs. Hofmann, let's start with you, because I think you are the reason we are here tonight, because you had the idea for the series and for the lecture. To put it in simple words, how come? What inspired or perhaps bothered you? Yeah, thank you very much. I've been doing research on internet-related issues for quite some time, probably more than two decades. And it occurred to me um, in the last year that it's about time to stop focusing just on single issues and try to draw a broader picture of the social transformations of our modern societies. And I also thought this idea of generating a broader picture should be both historically and theoretically grounded and not just consist of anecdotes. So my idea was that we need to invite great thinkers and I also wanted to put an emphasis on European thinkers. And there is a reason for that as well. Most of the works we see on this issue of internet and society and its transformation actually come from the origins of the technology. The US, the, especially the US has put a lot of money into research on the process of digitalization. And my wish uh, would be that we also cultivate a European perspective and sort of build on our European research traditions. And then finally, I wanted to create a public discourse that not only involves academics, but also the broader public. And that's why I'm so glad that we convinced uh, the Bundeszentrale to help us doing that. And you're here tonight from the Bundeszentrale, from the BPP. Um, she just mentioned, Mrs. Hofmann just mentioned the broader picture to not to have anecdotes, but to know what it's all about, to see the big picture. Do you feel the people you address, like ordinary people, citizens like you and me, do you feel like a need for that? Or is everyone just happy with smartphone in hand and social media accounts online? Well, it depends a bit on who we are talking about because we have a quite broad range of, mm -hmm. of what, we call, what we call target groups. But uh, what we uh, what we observed during during the last years is that um, there is a lot of 
um, in the traditional the, the traditional um, community of multipliers of civic education. On one hand, there, like for example, teachers, there is a lot of interest in more or less pragmatic questions. So, how can they use digital media in school? How can they teach certain aspects of media literacy? And, uh, but on the same time, there's also a quite huge interest in these fundamental questions that uh, will be raised during, during this lecture. But this always, let's, that's how what we uh, observed, is it always goes hand in hand with a mere rejection of anything that has to do with uh, digital society. And uh, well, I or my institution, we are not sure where this, where this leads to. Mm -hmm. If you have this attitude, doesn't it prevent to also discover uh, good potential of digitalization? Doesn't it prevent to think deeper and to analyze how we can, how we can shape, how we, could, how we can find uh, the right prerequisites to participate and influence the way that the developments will take? And this is a very, very, this is a very, very fundamental question for our organization. So it's, uh, it's w one of the core topics and uh, one of the cross-cutting topics that we are going to tackle next year. So it was a brilliant coincidence that Jeanette approached us for cooperation. And it seems you're quite a good match because you were talking about the big picture, the discourse, and you talked about like breaking it down, being pragmatic and, and making sense out of it. Okay. Let's talk about expectations. Um, what do you wish to achieve with this series? Um, one of my big issues is the question of agency, meaning who actually drives this process of transformation. Very often when we listen to the public discourse, it seems to be that the technology is nearly an autonomous force. And I don't think that is an adequate way of looking at the change we are seeing. So we need to get a better understanding of the interaction between society and what we see as digitalization, how we actually acquire new technologies, what kind of uh, projections, uh, uh, predictions we develop, etc. So what I want to achieve is that we sort of sharpen our view of what's going on and educate ourselves. Okay. What is the best that could happen tonight, Mrs. Grüne? What the best? The best that could happen tonight is that this would be uh, that this was, would be a start to broaden the platform of discussion on on the topics that have just been mentioned by uh, by Jeanette Hoffmann, because what uh, what we ob observe is that the discussion about uh, all this implication on society and politics of digitalization is uh, discussed in more or less closed uh, closed circles of experts uh, in the academic world. And I think it's, uh, it's the right time to open the platform for the debate. And well, uh, let's be blunt, I don't, I don't think that we have uh, a representative, uh, the re representation of, of all the population in Germany here, but at least we started to mix uh, the communities of BPB and the com and the communities of the institute, and this might be uh, this might be quite quite fruitful. This might uh, raise cross fertilization of discourses, and uh, over the year we will take up some of the uh, of the topics uh, of the a series of lectures and to break it down and to make it uh, digestible for ordinary citizens. Let's look at tonight's guest, um, because I think that the opening night like sets a tone for the whole series. Why did you choose Manuel Castells? I mean, first of all, he is... Can you change this one? First of all, he's certainly the most suitable person to invite as an opening lecturer, because he was actually the first one with a social science background who appreciated the significance of the changes to come. He started publishing his trilogy of the information age already in the mid-90s. That was at a time when perhaps most of the people here in the room didn't even know what the internet is. So 
I thought he would be the best person to approach, and then I sent him an email, and I couldn't believe it. He answered within a few minutes and said, yes, he would come. <laughs> I still, I mean, I was nearly shocked and thought this must be a ghost. It can't be him. But he did decide to come because he also liked this idea of developing a European perspective. Okay, so it was a brilliant idea. Thank you for having it and thank you for sharing it with us. And obviously 500, 400 people came tonight to hear him and to start the series. Thank you very much. So how do we proceed from here? Um, we'll first listen to Manuel Castell and his lecture. And then afterwards, we can have a talk with him. And since it's a talk about digital society, we use a digital tool so you can participate in it. The only thing you need for that is your smartphone, uh, where you can type in the questions you have during the talk. I'll explain later on how it works. It's not complicated at all. And uh, so we will be able to have a conversation with a lot of people in the room. So when we announced that uh, Manuel Castell is tonight's guest, the registration numbers jumped into heights unknown before. So we guess that you know who is here. <laughs> so my introduction to him is quite brief. Senoras y senores, please welcome with me influential sociologist, Professor Emeritus at Berkeley, author of the Information Age trilogy, Manuel Castells, Bienvenido. Thank you, Miriam. And I would like, first of all, uh, to thank um, the Humboldt Institute for Internet Society and the Federal Agency for Civic Education for their kind invitation that allows me to be here with you tonight to exchange a number of ideas about my, uh, the research I have been conducting in the last five, six years. Um, and I really want to thank all of you for your interest and presence here um, through the cold night of Berlin. Um, and I like particularly to be here with you tonight. And, and I can tell you that it's the secret uh, about why I, I answer immediately to Jeanette. But I have a deep appreciation for Berlin in many ways. Uh, it's among other things now, Berlin is widely considered one of the keynotes in, in intellectual, cultural, political innovation in Europe. Uh, and, and this is acknowledged, and this is one uh, testimony to human resilience and to the ability to overcome the miseries of wars and states and bureaucracies uh, to ultimately have this thriving culture in every aspect. Um, to relax before the lecture, I spent a significant part of the night yesterday, night at the uh, Berliner Republic Cafe, uh, which, as you know, is open until 5 a.m., and, <laughs> and that confirmed uh, my impressions of Berlin. I have been several times. Um, the, but I have not been in the last uh, eight years, so there was about, about time uh, to come back. Of course, my most significant experience in Berlin many years ago, I came to Berlin even at the time in which was a divided Berlin. But of course, the most significant experience in Berlin was in the early 1990, uh, when the moment it was still the GDR was there, but the, the, it was possible to cross the wall and with a small group of uh, friends, both Russian and German, we uh, crossed the wall like seven times in a row uh, to make sure that that was possible. And that what seemed to be unthinkable was starting to create a wall that would unite rather than separate. Uh, and I was very moved by that experience. And since then on, um, I have been uh, coming regularly. I presented in Berlin the German version of my trilogy, 
on the information age a few years ago, and that continues to be uh, part emotional, part intellectual um, interest uh, to be somewhat, a little bit part of your society. As, as you know, I, or some people know, I spend much of my intellectual life in Berkeley, but uh, now in Los Angeles, but still I spend more or less uh, half of my time in Europe, mainly in my Barcelona, but also going uh, to other places in, in Europe to feel uh, the vitality of this cultural interaction. My lecture tonight will be relating... Just for the last one. Sure. Thank you. You know, the only technology that never works is the sound technology in the lectures. Uh, so, uh, sometimes I decide to just throw away the micro and pick myself, since I, in my young age I was an actor in theater, uh, very close to sociologists. Uh, and, uh, and then I, I speak with my own voice, but no, I, I'm, I trust German technology, so now I'm going to uh, speak with some detail from here. So, the, the topic of my lecture today, to some extent, is for me, for me, the most important topic of the research I have been doing for quite a while. As some of this is in my book, Communication Power, but throughout the, the, uh, the last say six to seven years, this has been my uh, obsession because power relationships are the foundational relationships of society. This has been my leitmotif throughout my entire career, power. Why? Because those who are in power determine, shape the institutions and the norms that regulate our lives. So in that sense, power relationships are the foundational relations of society, are the DNA of societies. However, wherever the interesting thing is that wherever there is power, there is always counterpower. And in that sense, uh, my analysis is not an analysis of domination uh, in the classic tradition of uh, social science is always an analysis of domination, counter-domination, power relationships and resistance uh, to this power and uh, the ability and the possibility for people whose values and interests are excluded from the institutions of society to voice their dissent and to attempt uh, the change of the institutions that construct society. And in fact, our historical experience, then and now, is always determined by the interaction between power and counterpower, a relentless interaction. There is no social peace, sorry. Uh, it's an endless, constant interaction between the attempt to impose interest from the institutions and the attempt to change the institutions democratically or through different means to be able to um, to introduce new values and new interests in the institutions of society. And therefore, uh, the, pro the power has always been largely exercised through two main means. And this is also the way power has been conceptualized in the social sciences tradition. There are many forms of power, but fundamentally there are two major uh, processes, institutions of power, coercive power, persuasive power. The power over the bodies, the power over the minds. Meaning, on the one hand, power in the Max Weber tradition as the monopoly of Viol legitimate violence by the state. Well, I say the, monopol the monopoly of violence, legitimate or not, over the state. That's that really what has been considered the main form of power. But always 
has been another form of power, because the, that is the capacity of shape minds to elicit the consensus uh, of the subjects by the action of different centers of power in society, or at least the resignation of the subjects that that's the way it is, and we cannot do much about it. This is a fundamental process of, of power, which uh, goes long tradition uh, in, in the social sciences, uh, Foucault, but also to some extent, the notion of Gramsci about the hegemony of, uh, in society that was related to this capacity to shape minds, to shape the way we think. However, again, uh, this both coercive power and persuasive power uh, can be resisted and is resisted. And people react against the, uh, their inability to, uh, to be able to go into the discourse and into the um, debate in, in ways that they are protagonists of the debate and that they reshape the debate. And again, so there is power and counterpower, there is coercive power and persuasive power in both cases. And in both cases, but particularly in persuasive power, all depends on information and communication. Information and communication had been the critical tools of power and the critical tools of counterpower throughout history. Why? Because it, through communication, um, people are connected. So if the process of communication is controlled by those who are in power, then the signals that people receive in their brains comes from a system of values, interests, uh, symbols that are adapted to what the powerful think or would like that people think about themselves. And vice versa. The only way to change is when people who do not agree, do not accept the social order, communicate with other people who have similar attitudes and similar experience to, in my language, to reprogram the process of communication in terms of their own interests. And again, this communication system, this information retrieval system never ends and is in a constant dialectical relationship. However, information and communication are the key factors in the accumulation and distribution of wealth and power in society. And this is throughout history. And the actual processes that determine information and communication largely depend on specific technological paradigms meaning communication is very different depending on the communication technologies and information technologies of each time. Could be the printing press, could be uh, the, the, the church uh, discourses from the, the church authorities, but throughout history, the distribution of pamphlets has been essential uh, in, in any kind of, of revolution. So, um, in other words, uh, the way we think doesn't depend only on ourselves or some abstract culture in a, in a metaphysical sense. The way we think depends on the signals that we receive from others. So the connection between our neural networks and the communication networks on which any social activity uh, is based. Now, and in that sense, technology does not determine, but is an essential medium of organizing communication and the interaction between our neural networks on the basis of communication networks. The fundamental transformation of our time is the advent of ubiquitous digital communication and information networks. Um, a very good student of mine, a German actually, Martin Hilber, an economist, finished his dissertation with me in Los Angeles um, in 2010 and published uh, his summary of his dissertation in the journal Science, which is considered a standard of um, scientific research. And he, his dissertation was, um, for the first time, 
he calculated uh, the, the, the entire information existing in the planet and the platforms in which, and countries, and institutions in which this information uh, was processed. He showed that 92% of all the information in the planet, uh, measure, measure in, 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 in bytes, 92% uh, was already digitized. Now the proportion is about 95, 96%. So we live in a planet in which the enti almost entirely information is digitized, which allows, therefore, two things. Allows the existence of a common language of communication between different sets of information, and second, allows, <clears throat> allows the ability of processing information, digital technologies, to recombine, to exchange, to move at high speed in terms of volume and complexity, the communication process. And how this is transmitted? Well, the other, like, just give me, it's not really data, it's illustration, it's reminding you where we are in, in, in our society. Uh, the, currently, uh, this, of this 92, 96% of digitized information, the overwhelming proportion is accessible um, by internet and wireless networks of communication. Uh, we have today 4 billion internet users in the world on a planet of 7.5. And we have 7 billion, 7 billion on a planet of 7.5 wireless um, communication numbers, not devices, not phones, subscribers, meaning numbers to where you can call, um, excluding children under the age of three, although probably this is coming the moment where they have also their personal uh, wireless number, um, that means that we have a planet which is entirely connected. Of course, with different technologies, different capacities, and particularly different cultural and educational capacities to use this communication. But we are connected. And in addition, we already have at this point 50% of the adult population of the world has a smartphone that is a computer uh, in a wireless device. So in this new environment, a number of things are happening that deeply affect the um, institutions of power making and wealth making. And here we have to remind which are still the fundamental logics of these institutions. Institutions in general in society are organized around the state. And productivity and the source of wealth in our societies is organized around capital. State and capital are still the cornerstones of our social organization. So they still dominate anything that happens even in the new technological environment. Although one of the critical matters about the internet is that the users of the internet have shaped the actual technologies and content of the internet use throughout their history. Both state and capital, however, operate in a given technological environment in our societies, that is the digitization of everything. States seek to establish and maintain power. Capital seeks to increase profits. This has not changed. Power is maintained by the institutional control of communication, either governments or media uh, control by big corporations. The maintenance of power requires extensive surveillance for competition with other states and for keeping order internally, while capital expansion depends on the relentless capacity of commodifying everything, transforming everything in a commodity that can be bought and sold. And again, in both processes, 
information and communication, meaning digital communication in our society, are essential. Indeed, the internet was characterized, and it is, as a technology of freedom, of free communication. And it is a technology of free communication because uh, simply because those who designed the internet technologies uh, in the 1960s, 70s, deliberately tried to have to design a technology that would be difficult to control. It's one of the greatest paradoxes of internet history that even if the program that led to internet uh, was financed by DARPA, the uh, Defense Department of the United States Research Agency, they actually was not uh, intended as a military use by any means, was actually funding computer scientists working uh, in designing new forms of computer communication. And at the beginning, they really didn't know what to use for. They mainly, they, they tried to use it for um, uh, using the, capaci the spare capacity of computers uh, to uh, increase time that they could use the computers so by sharing the capacity of either computers. But very, very soon they, they derive to our other uses and the most important first email list that, that developed by the computer scientists, mainly in the university campuses, was about sharing science fiction movies and novels and uh, the way to buy weed everywhere. Um, this, this is the source of internet collaboration. Um, the, however, through that, these technologies, and that's the critical point, technologies of freedom are only as free as they are used for freedom. But the fundamental transformation is that all communication became digitized and interconnected and created this, the basis for massive global digital surveillance, which is the most important expression of power in our society. Digital surveillance is comprehensive in an entirely integrated digital environment. It's what we call the digital exhaust. The digital exhaust means that all the information is connected and therefore can be treated as a system. The key issue is connecting credit cards, phone calls, computer activity, search history, ID numbers, financial transactions, email communication, social networking sites, and all the interaction in the social networking sites. Because there is the possibility of connecting everything with everything, there is also the possibility of surveilling, retrieving information, and organizing this information uh, in the interest of those who survey. So what has emerged, particularly in the last decade, is what I call a global surveillance bureaucracy that whose major quantum leap took place after the 9-11 bombing of New York, because that created the basis for funding and legal support in the United States and then throughout the world of uh, extraordinary powers given to the surveillance agencies. Particularly in the United States, the uh, NSA, the National Security Agency, but all major countries have um, strengthened the power of surveillance of their own agencies. GCHQ in, in the United Kingdom, it's, uh, it's, it's probably the most sophisticated surveillance agency and the BDN agency in Germany uh, is also a powerful surveillance agency, and they are all connected. That's the important thing. They are all connected um, with France and Israel, etc. They are all connected. And the connection is extremely important because legislation, in some cases, uh, forbids an, a surveillance agency to spy citizens of their own country. Uh, so what they do is very simple. And this is real life, not, not just examples. The French spy the Germans, the Germans spy the French, and then they exchange information. <laughs> so that's the, the most direct and important expression of the logic of power 
in the digital age is the, cost, the formation of, of a fundamentally a panopticon of extraordinary proportions in which everything is known by governments with very little judicial control, in fact. At the same time, there is a different process that comes not from the state, but from capital and the logic of profit, which is the commodification of information, whose most important effect is transforming consumers of communication, meaning everybody, into data. We are all data that become, and these data are key commodities. These data are at the basis of the business model of all the major internet companies, Google and others, in the sense that, uh, as they say in Silicon Valley, if you are not paying for a service, you are paying with your data. You are uh, the, the currency. And this goes into advertising, goes into political uh, manipulation, goes into everything. But the most important thing is to retrieve the information for, from everybody. And here is a certain paradox, but it's a very, very important one, a defining one. Because communication is free communication, free in the sense that people can communicate with everybody, because of that, there has been a massive decentralization of communication. At the same time, there is a massive concentration of information, meaning all the major companies as well as governments concentrate information from what? From the, pract the massive practice of people communicating with everything and with everybody on a daily basis. So because we actually communicate everything, the information retrieval agencies can pick up all our information without any problem. Precisely, precisely because we are a highly communicated society, at the same time, there is a high level of monopoly of information, both by the state and by private companies. Yes, we have uh, the notion that we have uh, the rights, protecting rights in terms of um, digital privacy. Well, as you know, Scott McNeely, the, the founder and, and CEO of um, uh, Sun Microsystems in 1999, already issued the famous statement, privacy in the digital age, get over it. There is absolutely no privacy. Yes, companies have privacy policies. For instance, Google has a privacy policy. Uh, please go to the Google a website and read what is the privacy policy of Google. I can tell you. The only information, this is citing, the only information Google reserves the right to obtain and process from its users is the only one. Name, address, location, email, phone number, credit card number, search history, browsing habits, purchases, and selected content of emails. Other than that, privacy respected. This is the official privacy policy. I'm not being demagogic. I'm trying to be analytical always. <laughs> so now we are moving into the direction of a new form of total networking and digitization, what is called in the pop culture the Internet of Things meaning that what is connected increasingly is machines connecting machines with machines, connecting objects, and creating a hybrid network in which we are connecting among humans, but each one of the humans are connected with objects, and these objects are connected among themselves. And the machines of different companies are organizing the connection according to their programs. Certainly, their programs are ultimately programmed by humans. But at the same time, the uh, logic of this connection follows certain protocols, certain algorithms, that's the key. Uh, algorithms are, in most cases, both for the governments and for companies, are secret. And these algorithms include criteria 
such as the ability of a given network to reprogram itself constantly according to some meta program to make it more efficient, more comprehensive, and faster. So we all, not that we are moving, this is not science fiction, I never do science fiction. What, I, what, I, what it is, is we already are in a world of not billions, but trillions of networks that all of them are programmed outside control and all of them ultimately have their own logic, which is partly, te <clears throat> partly technological and partly linked to the interests of the state and of the large uh, internet companies. Now, the state and companies interact through all kinds of technological, economic, and institutional corporations. They have, the companies have contracts for uh, the surveillance agencies. The, the surveillance agencies make favors to the companies, but this is not exactly the same logic. Uh, in fact, during the key moment in which the uh, National Security Agency uh, was given all power to do everything they wanted, um, there was, they, they, technologically they were not very advanced, particularly they, they were not able to break some of the en encryption procedures. So they actually got most of the technology from the private sector, uh, and particularly from the, the usual suspects, from Google, from Apple, uh, from um, Facebook, and, and the companies that uh, originally were developing the new communication technologies. But at the same time, there are some important contradictions, because the, if consumers start panicking about their total lack, lack of privacy, then they could try to protect the information through the one procedure that companies uh, fear the most, encryption and control by them. The battle over encryption is a fundamental battle because it's ultimately the only way in which we could protect ourselves. And the ability, the diffusion, massive diffusion of encryption capacity, which the technology would be common, but the actual code of each encrypted message would be different and controlled by the user, this is what panics governments and what panics companies. Now, companies fear that if they push too much in the logic of um, controlling and providing information of every one of us to uh, governments, then the backlash could ruin their business model. That remember, their business model is our voluntary delivery of our lives transformed into data for this data to be sold and organized in the entire commercial world so that we can be targeted as consumers, we can predict it in terms of behavior. Uh, you go to some place, uh, to, to a restaurant, you, they will know exactly your supposed culinary taste. The same thing with books, the same thing with travel, the same thing with everything. That's why companies, Amazon and others, provide you with a list of the things that you are supposed to do because you have done in the past. So you become a linear program trajectory in which you are the reflection of yourself the rest of your life. And every is a very flexible programming. So you change habits, well, this is also goes into the program and you are uh, guided in the new direction. So the logic of power is not the same thing than the logic of commodity. Because the logic of power as the uh, head of the um, National Security Agency of the United States said, uh, well, you know, to find indications of a terrorist activity um, is in the, in the wall at large, uh, is like finding a needle in a haystack. So to do that, I need the entire haystack, meaning the entire uh, set of information everywhere. And then the programs can work. But this is the logic of power. Again, it's not the logic of commercialization and commodity. So there are contradictions. And even in some cases, companies like Apple have resisted. In other cases, Mark Zuckerberg has led a movement to uh, stop uh, the government of forcing the transmission of data. 
Uh, and in other cases, uh, companies simply uh, play this game of resisting and cooperating depending on moment. So it's a complex logic, it's an interactive logic, it's not the same, there are two different logics, but the two uh, logics together uh, control the entire um, information system on which our life depends. Which are the consequences of this? Well, first of all, democracy is threatened by comprehensive surveillance because there is a symmetry between the surveillors and the surveil. Meaning, uh, state and companies have access to information, to the uses of information, to the uses of information, and the users don't. So it's one fundamental difference in asymmetry in, in our society. Privacy is, of course, uh, obliterated by the commodification of data without consent. So this analysis and this logic apparently moves toward the so-called Orwellian universe of Big Brother controlling everything. Fortunately, things in history and in our society as well are more complicated because people have their will and their capacity. And even if they don't know technology, they have a passion for their freedom in general terms. And institutions of society are not one-dimensional institutions. They are the result of uh, historical struggles between control and resistance to control. So wherever there is surveillance and wherever there is breaching of privacy, there is also counter-surveillance and the defense of privacy operating along various lines of action, such as there, are, there, is, there are a number of legal regulations dependent on the institutions, political, judicial institutions. For instance, there is more protection in the European Union than in the United States by far, let alone in China. Um, however, state, both state and capital tend to counter the autonomy of these institutions. This unstable balance depends on policy choices. And ultimately, there is, in the case of government, there is always one key argument. National emergency, security, in a world threatened by terrorists, in a world in which the powers of governments are constantly increased, there is always the possibility to activate some legislation which goes to, through the judicial authority, like FISA in the United States, with to obtain permission, and with the judicial permission, then they can operate legally with total control of information. How this works? Very easy. FISA has a number of judges, and I could tell something similar about Europe, a number of judges which are accredited by FISA, judges that are in principle independent judges. But statistically speaking, no one single decision by the National Security Agency has been reversed by a FISA judge, not one in the last 20 years that the institution existed. So national security and emergency had become the, the cover of every uh, attempt to curtail the uh, liberty and privacy that democratic societies in principle have. Um, but again, there are still a number of judicial and legal protections that limit the power of surveillance. Also, technologies of privacy protection, encryption and others, which uh, hackers continue to develop every day as a way to resist the control and the monopoly of information. There are also a number of uh, activities by legal social activism, a number of organizations, such as the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Greenpeace, and others, that um, uh, try to show the limits of the surveillance power. For instance, um, Greenpeace was able to detect the um, location of the uh, 
repository of data, of clandestine data by the National Security Agency in a remote area of Bluffdale, Utah, and then flew a blimp over the repository, uh, Greenpeace blimp, with an arrow saying, here is the, the, the data of your illegal spying, uh, which of course created a whole uproar. In other words, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation files constant lawsuits against the United States. The same thing in the European Union, I multiple actions uh, in, 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 as well as in the uh, UK, uh, multiple actions of legal defense against the system. Um, hackers have developed all kinds of technology networks to protect free communication and freedom of information in this particular context. For instance, the network const constructed originally from Sweden, but later expanded to other places, to, uh, to, to other countries, uh, Tor, the Onion Router, that, for instance, was able to maintain internet working partly in Egypt in 2011, during the time Egypt canceled the internet, or tried to cancel the internet for five days until they gave up because they were not able to. Um, then a very important activity of the whistleblowers, like Snowden and others. Snowden is only the last one, uh, but there were many others uh, within the security agencies of the United States and of uh, the European Union. People who, out of principle, decide that they have to denounce what's going on. Uh, Snowden, what happened with him is that he knew what happened to those who were whistleblowers before him, who were li literally damaged for life in terms of uh, persecution, in terms of uh, confiscation of their uh, goods, of their homes, or their everything. They were ruined forever. So he prepared his exit way in advance to start his activities of collecting data about what the NSA was doing as part of a heroic mission to um, respond to this kind of uh, activity against the principles of the American democracy. Of course, he ended up in a Moscow suburb. So everybody has concluded that uh, it was a Russian spy from the beginning. It was not such. Uh, he tried to do something else. He tried to ask for political asylum in some of the democratic regimes in Latin America, particularly he was trying to go to Ecuador, um, but he couldn't. He couldn't because um, once he was in Moscow escaping from Hong Kong, uh, every flight in which he was suspected that he could be, including the flight, the flight of uh, President of Bolivia, Evo Morales, would be intercepted over the European airspace to search the plane to detain Snowden. So at one point, just simply he couldn't move at all. And so he's still there. Uh, and I would guess that at one point, the Russian influence starts being significant, but was not the origin of, the, of, of, of his, of his uh, resistance. And as well as uh, the very controversial case of, but important, of WikiLeaks, in which uh, they are not the whistleblowers, but they publicize and they distribute throughout the world uh, the informations of illegal or not public activities from governments and companies that should be known by the citizens, but they are not. They are not. So in other words, this is to show that the more we go deeply into this system of systematic surveillance and breaching of liberties and privacy, at the same time, in many different ways, individuals, organizations, uh, social activists, technological activists react and create a counter dynamics which is different. Moreover, there has been the rise today, nowadays, of what is known as citizen journalism, using surveillance technology to surveil the surveillance and to surveil those uh, abuses of power, from police brutality to financial wrongdoing. Uh, this um, 
Um, today, one of the most important transformations is that anyone with a cell phone, with a camera, meaning all the cell phones, practically, can surprise some personality, some bureaucrat, some politician, some leader of a company, anyone doing something wrong, or ethically wrong, or legally wrong, and can take the picture and upload it immediately. And that starts a whole process of uh, denunciation, protest, and sometimes legal action. This is what social movement these days do systematically against police brutality uh, everywhere. That's an incredible instrument of control. That's why every time that people start talking about, well, we are in a terrorist state because all this surveillance comes upon our life. Yes, but I can tell you that politicians these days, when they do not behave, and many of them don't, uh, they live their lives underground. You know, they, they, most of their lives, they, they, they spend their time uh, m making sure that nobody sees them, that nobody knows about their financial deals, etc., etc., etc. So it's both. It's both. We surveil and we counter surveil all the time. And then, of course, there is a fundamental change that has taken place in social movements around the world with these particular technologies. It has been the rise of what I have studied lately of what network social movement. That is, social movements that start outside the traditional political parties and traditional institutions, and that they organize their own connection on the basis of a spontaneous uprising, usually triggered by outrage and not necessarily by ideology. And then from there, they grow into major social movements, such as Occupy, the number of years of the Spanish 15 uh, of May movement uh, and movements all over the world, in Latin America, in Asia, even in Africa. So the social movements of our time are movements in which the capacity to organize their own communication networks on the basis of their own ideas and their own outrage share with others without necessarily having an organization, without having a common ideology, without having a common project. This has been completely transformed thanks to their capacity to use a free communication system to bypass the traditional controls. Now, as you know, a number of people, but usually traditional uh, media and as well as um, the uh, politicians of all kind have downplayed the importance of these movements, saying, well, they get tired, they produce nothing. Well, in my book, Nervous of Outrage and, and Hope, uh, I showed a number of key examples of actual political change and political transformation in many countries linked to the ripple effects, to the second level effects of these social movements, which that do not happen in one day, because they are not violent movements in any way, but permeate, they use the transformation through the minds of the people. So the process is social movements organize themselves on the basis of horizontal new forms of free communication, networks based on the internet and wireless communication. In their action, symbolic action, sometimes since through the internet, but mainly is through the combination of internet and occupation of urban space and the connection between the two sets of networks, urban networks and internet networks. On the basis of this, they create what I call a space of autonomy. This space of autonomy is the beginning of the ability to connect with other people who are equally uh, outraged and at the same time start deliberation and process to provide alternative projects in society without going through the same traditional channels of political organization. All right, these movements, through their action, even if they don't seize power in the sense of occupying the state. What they do is they influence the transformation of consciousness in the minds of people, as has always been the role of social movements. Social movements are fundamentally aiming at changing the values of society, as the environmental movement, as the feminist movement, as the um, identity movement of many different kinds. 
So the same thing with this kind of network social movement. Through their action, the minds of the people change, and eventually, in some cases, political changes also happen at the level of the institutions. An example of this is the transformation of the Spanish political system through the actions of the parties that um, resulted from the 15 uh, May movement, particularly the so-called Podemos, which now controls about 20% of the Spanish vote, or the uh, most recent example, because I, I like also to show the examples that happen uh, with some effects after three, four, five years uh, after the movement, the example in the Chilean presidential election, in which uh, the, the leaders of the student movement uh, of four years ago now decided to create a new party because neither the right or the center left uh, respond to their aspirations and they in the first election they have obtained over 20 percent of the vote and therefore they are becoming the arbiters of the new election the new presidential election in chile and for you to see uh, they had the leaders of the movement were so young that they could not reach the legal age to be president so they have to ask a friend, a nice woman, uh, could you be our presidential candidate because we, we, we cannot if we win. Uh, so in other words, um, the connection goes through communication networks that creates a process of mobilization that ultimately affects not just the, the people who are in the movement, but the society at large, for instance, in the case of Spain, there were 70% of the population was in agreement with this movement. In the case of the United States, against what is considered uh, the failure of the Occupy Wall Street movement, it actually had a significant success um, and uh, obtained a support of about one third of the population in terms of, uh, of the uh, support of the movement and the hostility only of a 20% of the population. They were significant in changing the public opinion, particularly among the, the young uh, people of America. Now, when someone would say, well, okay, so what a nice political effect, Trump. Um, point is, the Trump, as much as one can say, uh, the mystery of this uh, ignorant, sexist, racist, uh, uh, arrogant, narcissist guy becoming president of the United States has to be understood as a reaction against the establishment of both the Republicans and the Democrats. That what made possible the election of Trump. But on the other hand, there was also another anti-establishment candidate in the Democratic Party that had serious chances, and in fact the studies show that he would have beaten um, Trump in the general election. Bernie Sanders, senator, who was part of the Occupy movement, literally part, being in the camps of the Occupy movement, and therefore triggered a huge mobilization among the young people that was crushed in the process of nomination by the bureaucratic apparatus of the Democratic Party to present, in the most unbelievable mistake in politics, to present the super establishment candidate, Hillary Clinton, financial establishment and political establishment, against the anti-establishment candidate. So even, even with that, Trump being as, 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 he, as, he, as he is, uh, Hillary won the popular vote by two million, but Trump concentrated his support in key states where the working class had been hurt by globalization, and he was able to, to win. But Bernie Sanders both had won in these same states and was actually um, pushed out of the race by their own Democratic Party establishment. This is not to go now into this electoral analysis, it's to show that there were also important effects of the network social movements in the political system, even in the United States. I could go country after country. When there was a movement, it doesn't mean that because there were no movements in, in, in all countries. When there was a movement, that had a significant effect. Now, these social movements could not have existed without the capacity to uh, communicate through 
digital networks of communication. Absolutely not. Could be some protest, but the kind, what they were, what they did, was possible because of these new communication technologies. Um, problem is, of course, that uh, they were able to do so, but at the same time, uh, they were somewhat prisoner of the uh, network technologies that existed. They communicated through Twitter, through Facebook, through Instagram, etc. However, they are very conscious of that. And they have developed a, a series of new technologies of communication that could be encrypted and not controlled by, uh, for instance, Facebook, just in case toward the future. Particularly, they developed some technology, encrypted technology called N minus uh, one. The problem is that very limited, works very well in a small uh, networks, but not in large networks, but a number of other experiences. And ultimately, all these movements are massively using a different kind of networking technology, Telegram, uh, that was developed in Germany uh, by uh, Russian hackers that immigrated from Russia, uh, but work on the possibility of generating encrypted technologies for the communication of social movements independent from the other uh, uh, major institutions. So internet ultimately has become, has shown its potential as a space of free expression and disintermediation of communication control. That's why the defense of internet freedom has become one of the fundamental political battles of the world. Because, of course, the uh, internet in itself cannot be controlled, but it can be intercepted in many ways. And also, uh, the, those who uh, propose messages that are anti-establishment in the internet can be identified, for instance, in China, and punished. However, I always say, having studied in depth the Chinese uh, system of control, that yes, uh, the messenger can be identified and punished and sent to prison. And there are many, many, many hundreds of Chinese um, activists in jail. However, the message cannot be intercepted. The message as such would have to be intercepted in the entire internet network, and this is literally impossible. So if you are the messenger, that's important. Uh, but if you are the message, you can go on and live and communicate and diffuse. And in that sense, the internet is a space of uh, free communication. Free communication doesn't mean the kind of freedom uh, for the uses that we would like in normative terms. Um, the Trump movement was very active in organizing networks of racist and uh, sexist uh, mobilizations. And the same thing in Germany with the neo-Nazi parties, an alternative for Germany, etc., etc. So the fact the internet has free communication, it doesn't mean that this is for the good uses according to each one's taste. It's for whatever happens in society. Internet is the mirror of society. How good or how bad society is, each one of us, that is immediately reflected in the internet. So the key question is not about the, if technology is good or bad, because it's not. Um, as um, the great historian of technology, Marvin Kranzberg, um, said, technology is neither good or bad, neither it is neutral. Meaning what? That is very important, but the defects, the, the effects are undetermined. Internet is used to be and is a free communication system, but the uses of this freedom are socially determined. Social media, social networks now are largely taking over the communication space and largely pushing aside the mass media. Mass media were not always reliable, were not always the first system of communication, and not always uh, as truthful as they want to, to say they are. For instance, remember the great New York Times reporting the existence of uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, uh, helping to trigger the war. Um, but um, to a large extent, the most important thing now 
is not the replacement of one system by another, but what I call a general cacophony of information and ideas in the, uh, in the social networks. The period of post-truth, they call, now lies are called post-truth. Um, so every, everything is there, lies, bots that multiply by hundreds and thousands the uh, fake news that are uh, circulating in the, uh, in the internet and in the social networks. Can we do something about that? Yes and no. Because technologically, even if some of the bot programs can be deactivated, by fake news, it's literally impossible to control if people produce fake news, if people pollute the information over the internet. So the only answer is the ability of educated citizens, informed citizens, to actively participate in these exchanges and correct the information and correct the ideas according to their experience, to their values, and to their interests. And I finish. The issue is that in a new technological environment, which uh, I have tried to show the historical novelty, we still have the oldest social struggle. We still have the struggle against the abuses of power from the state and the exploitation from monopoly companies. And this struggle continues to be and con will continue to be in defense of the freedom and dignity of the humankind. New technologies, old issues, all forms of oppression and all and new forms of struggle and response to the oppression. Thank you for your interest. Come in, Miriam. Thanks for coming. So it's time for our talk now. And not only between Manuel Castells and me, but between you and him. If you would like to tweet. Yeah, that's, for me? that's for you. Yeah, because I have my own. If you'd like to Twitter, uh, the hashtag is digital society. And if you would like to participate here or from uh, your couch or sofa or whatever, wherever you are, you can use your smartphone. If you need the internet right here at Kine International, the password is digital2017. So you can just open your browser and go to the website that is down here, menti.com. And the next step is that you um, type it in, the code you see there, 847094. And with that, you should be able to type in a question. It's the same like in Twitter, it's 140 mm -hmm. characters. So be short, be precise with your questions. And let's just try out if it works. Good question. The problem is that we said, okay, 500 people in a room, if we have one microphone, it's a question of power, who gets it, you know? So we chose to use that tool so that many people can participate. I, I can tell you one problem. There's no escape in that sense. You can counter with your ideas the, 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 uh, what the surveillance tries to impose, but this is being recorded, okay? And the, <laughs> And, and, and it's being a stream, so we are uh, in the system. The, you know, we, one thing, uh, sorry that I anticipate, but this is a critical point. How I cannot, part well, it's very simple. Don't be in Facebook, don't be in Twitter, don't be in any uh, social network at all. Um, don't be in YouTube, don't be, don't be in anything. Don't use Google, of course. Uh, don't, don't use Baidu if you're in China. Don't, don't use anything, and in addition, don't use credit cards and never give your ID connected to any electronic transaction that you have. 
And if you do Bitcoin, be careful because Bitcoin also transmits data. Okay, so it, it's the no, the way not to be in the digital is exhaust is not to conform to any of the current practice and habits of society. That's why it's so tricky. So we're not citizens anymore. I see that you, it's working, the tool is working. Um, we, I would like to ask you to just type in shortly why you're here. You have already typed in some questions. Let's just see why you're here tonight, because Mrs. Hoffman, for example, she said, I'm here to have the bigger picture. That's why I'm here, my reason for being here. So let's just check out the tool if it works and write why you're here, what your reason is to be here. Interest is one answer. <laughs> to better understand our society today is one of the reasons. That you? You said that or someone? This is the, the audience, that's not me. And there's someone writing a master thesis on discursive power on Twitter. So it's a concrete academic interest, I would say. Okay. So let's go on um, to the question part. So you can type in your questions now. I just put on the next slide, so you should be able to type in your questions. And... We continue while we're waiting for the questions. Senor, Senor Castells, I switched between Spanish and, and English, I'm sorry. Catalan, please. Catalan, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that shaping our minds is where power comes from. The ability to shape minds is the fundamental source of power, and you once said that torturing bodies is less effective than shaping the minds. This is why pure repression won't last. So let's see where that power exactly comes from. How, how does it work? Let's have a closer look at it. Well, it, it can be promoting... Uh, the main thing is, is resignation, but it can be promoting the idea that <coughs> your life uh, is better if you simply mold your life what is happening already and the instructions that, that you, you do. If you are a, a good citizen in the sense that you just follow the norms and you follow instructions. Um, as <coughs> women of three generations ago were told by their mothers and grandmothers, um, you have to do this way and this way, or you will not be able to marry and then you are in trouble. Well, that's one way. <clears throat> the other, which is more and more frequent, is what I call resignation, meaning there is no other way. Uh, and the, the, the system, in, in terms of when you don't follow some of the basic rules of society, you may end up in very bad situation in terms of paying your rent, uh, going on with your life, uh, having a, a regular job that determines everything else that happens in life. So ultimately, uh, since alternatives to the existing order are not very visible, since what used to be party politics has become two different versions of the same form of life and domination, well, then people are discouraged in terms of the, any possibility to change their life. So they go into their intimate life, their private life. They go into uh, try to make my life in a way that at least I have some pleasure of existence with my friends, my love, my family, my work, but only as long as you keep it within in your individual existence and projects, you will not find obstacles. If you try, for instance, what I we just discussed. For instance, if you don't want your life to be known, completely known, in every detail, you have to become a marginal person in this society. Uh, imagine that you don't want to, to, to pay with credit cards. Well, because, by the way, credit cards is the most important element of loss of privacy <clears throat> that we have. 
through your credit card, everything is known because then it's connected to everything else. So uh, try to try to have a life without a credit card. I, I can tell you people who can do it, uh, uh, drug traffickers and, 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 and professional criminals. They don't use credit cards, um, they pay cash. However, they can work in terms of cash because they are not afraid that someone taking the cash from them in the street. Um, so that's the critical matter. The critical matter is that there are certain norms of society that you have to abide by these norms or then you will be marginalized. As long as things are okay, meaning that you have a life which is not dramatic, then, then it's all right. But if you, at any moment where there is a financial crisis, an economic crisis, a job crisis, or simply the incapacity to accept stupidity in your daily life in terms of what happens in the school or in the office or anywhere, at that point, any disaffected behavior becomes stigmatized and then you start having the series of uh, gestures that poison your life. So you better stay quiet and behave. That's what I mean. And that's how life is shaped in the minds. And this is reproduced in the mass media. This is reproduced in the schools. This is reproduced in the institutions. Uh, this is the normalization of life is through all the systems of communication that ultimately define what is good, what is bad, what is dangerous, what is standard. So one effect of power is resignation. Is what? Resignation. Yeah, a fundamental effect. But how can we be active citizens, participate, have a normal social life with a credit card and not resignate? Well, the general experience in society is that people accept resignation as the less evil until they cannot take it anymore. And so that's why uh, in terms of now talking about some kind of political neuroscience, there are two key uh, emotions that shape uh, human behavior. Most important, fear. Most important emotion shaping human behavior is fear. Fear is the most important one. We, we all move our lives in terms of fear, being afraid of this or this or this or this. Fear, that nothing bad happens to us. That's one. The, an, the antidote against fear, it's already another emotion which is, not, and is known as outrage. Meaning, when you cannot take it anymore, and then you explode. So, that's why my book is from uh, outrage to hope. Because then the third emotion is when you project a different life, which is hope. So the sequence is you are afraid, and therefore you don't move, you don't do anything, you accept whatever. At one point, things are so unbearable that you explode. Can be individual, can be social, can be at the school, can be in your job, can be in society at large. And then from there, this explosion is communicated through communication networks to others, and then what is an individual experience becomes a social experience through the act of communication, and that that leads to the deliberation of other possibilities which uh, induce hope, which is the potent positive emotion to transcend your current state of life. And this is where social movements come in. Exactly. Okay. A quick and a very... Tricky question um, from the audience. Is the internet beneficial for or a threat to democracy? Is, is, is what? Is the internet beneficial or is it a threat to democracy? The internet depends, internet depends on what we call democracy. If by democracy we call the reproduction of the existing institutions without deliberation or challenge from the citizens, Internet is, an, is a threat to powers that be in every country. You know, I have been so many times in commissions of different governments, institutions, the European Union, the United Nations, etc., about the, the internet policy. And the first question the government representatives ask always is, how can we control the internet? And when I say, ah, uh -uh, difficult, um, 
uh, ask the governments that try to do it, and you cannot. It's like controlling electricity. Internet is the basis of the entire information and communication system in our societies, and therefore they are not interested anymore in doing anything about the internet. Uh, in other words, governments do not like the internet. Uh, they, in general, I'm talking in general. Of course, there are exceptions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But why not? Because um, governments are based in, their, in, term, in terms of their power on the capacity to control information and communication. And internet actually removes much of the control of communication from the hands of government institutions. And every time that they, they can, they use a pretext, national security, for instance, to curtail internet freedom. Uh, before, for instance, in the 1990s, with Clinton in the United States, they used, they tried to use what everybody has used, a child pornography. So of course, we are all uh, indignant about child pornography. So they tried to use child pornography as a way to develop a number of controls over the internet. Well, one of the examples of what I was telling you before about the judicial protection of freedom, in that particular case in the United States, the act of um, what was called the act of decency in the internet by Clinton, a Democrat, um, and a liberal Democrat, uh, it was actually struck down by the federal courts in a sentence that was quite interesting in terms of the language. The Federal Court of Appeals uh, canceled the law as an attempt to curtail freedom of expression and added, yes, it's true that much of this freedom of expression in the internet is chaos, but citizens have a constitutional right to chaos, which I think is an interesting notion. Um, so uh, to a large extent, uh, the governments to a large extent, governments would like to divide the internet between the useful internet, education, business, etc., and the free expression of everything in the internet, which is in the essence of the internet culture. And that's a debate in society. Should we be free of communicating, even if this creates uh, many uncontrolled expressions? For instance, to take a clear example, sexism. Internet is full of sexism. So should then should cut off the internet? Well, the bad news is that even if we want it, we cannot. There are some critical voices here. One says, <clears throat> where is the theory? The other one says, why didn't you talk about society? About? About society. And... Oh, yeah. Very legitimate question. <laughs> And the other one says that these are phenomena that have been described 50 years ago. Why do we see no theoretical advancement? Why is science so populist? All right. So that's a really very important question. Well, I talk about society because that's my job. I'm a social scientist, and I try to understand the process of society. I'm not a technologist. I'm trying to study, and I have been trying to study the interaction between new technological forms and social processes of every kind. Um, but <clears throat> about the theory, <coughs> I actually, I don't do theory. Um, I, try, I try to do research, which means understanding real social processes in the world. Of course, we need some theoretical tools, but I don't do theory for the sake of theory. I try to understand, and what I need some concepts, I create the concepts, or I borrow concepts sometimes, uh, and use these concepts to organize the information that leads to the understanding of a particular social process. Um, many of the theories, for instance, about social movements do not really understand what is the novelty of social movements when it's based on free networks of communication. Much of what is the analysis of surveillance relates to old theories of surveillance and construction of uh, the discourse that do not really uh, interact with the process we observe now. I would make one exception, that is uh, Foucault, uh, which I do think that uh, it would be interesting if he could see that beyond the institution that he 
mentioned as the surveillance, other panopticons could be, could be uh, experiencing humankind. But fundamentally, I would say that if you would, today I certainly did not uh, use a theory per se, but um, in my books, I developed theory on the basis of my observation. And on this particular topic, I had a 600 pages book called Communication Power, which um, at the end of the book, on the basis of all the information and analysis, empirical analysis I have produced, proposes a theory of power, which I call a network theory of power. So I certainly today I didn't introduce much of the theory of power, although, although I implicitly refer to the logic of networks as critical in our type of society. But to be more blunt, uh, I'm a very non-typical social scientist in that sense. I don't think that facts per se uh, explain anything. We have to construct analytical frameworks, but simply specific analytical frameworks to explain something. If it's possible to relate to grand theory and to general theory, maybe, but that's not my personal interest. My personal interest is to understand the world as it works, because what I would like is that people can use my analysis to change it. Let's talk about power and, and counter power. There are some questions here from you. One question is, would you suggest that there is a balance between power and counter power as you gave examples for? And another question is, does the digital age make counter power more effective? More effective? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the balance is always unstable. Uh, institutions are what I call crystallized power. That is, power relationships that at one point in history were dominant and constructed a constitution, a state, laws that create the framework for human behavior. So power is institutionalized. The institutions are an expression of power, but not only of power. Uh, where also institutions are the expression of the resistance to this power. For instance, the most typical example is not just the logic of capital and business interest, it's also the logic of the working class struggles that developed for many decades and ultimately uh, created the welfare state, workers' unions, uh, workers' rights, etc. It's both things at the same time. But it never ends. Every time that there is an economic crisis, the main attempt is to cut down the wages on the, uh, with the idea that this will increase the profits and the economy will work because profit will be increased. So it's always an unstable matter. Um, women rights. Women rights, again, 30 years ago, were almost entirely ignored in many, many ways. The, the feminist movement and the women's movement in general in many countries, in most countries, have completely changed the consciousness of women and therefore the women condition in many ways. So this has changed in terms of legislation, in terms of appointments of women to positions of power, in terms of what is taught in the schools, in terms of the re gender relationship at all levels of society. But at the same time, uh, the reaction in many cases is uh, violence against women, which is not prosecuted with uh, too much energy in many countries and in many instances. So it's constantly, it's a constant struggle to reinstate the women's rights that were uh, conquered decades ago. So that's, for me, is an example that the situation is never completely stabilized. Are we making progress toward more equal rights in every aspect? Depends, depends on countries, depends on issues. Uh, what was the stigmatization of uh, homosexual right to marriage, for instance, um, years ago, now has been normalized in some societies, but not in many others. And the stigma and discrimination continues to work against homosexuals, against transsexuals, and in the entire society. So again, there is a constant struggle to defend new frontiers of human rights, and at the same time, uh, a constant attempt to reestablish instruments of discrimination and oppression. The most important thing in Europe these days is xenophobia, the hatred of people who uh, are different, apparently different in cultural or ethnic terms. 
the hatred of people who try desperately to make a new life in the context of rich affluent Europe. Well, this is a human right which is being denied in practice under the pressure of certain segments of the population. So this struggle never ends. There are two questions. There's a question in Catalan, by the way, which I cannot read. And that's I'm okay. going to pass it on to you afterwards. No, that's okay. Just, just um, trying to, to say if you want to change language, let's change language. <laughs> um, there's a basically fundamental question. Are the non-digital citizens powerless? This is one question, uh, because you were talking about the 4.5 billion people being online and the other, what, what happens to the others. And the other question is, um, what, do we have a free choice in a digital world? A very good question, really. Well, first of all, um, uh, I was talking about regular internet users in terms of the, um, now, in terms of connectivity, I insist that not necessarily through internet, but in terms of connectivity, everybody is at this point, everybody, with some exceptions, is connected if we have seven billion numbers of uh, mobile phones in practice, of which half are um, the so-called smartphones, right? The, the, the other thing is in terms of, in terms of these users of the internet, The big divide is not anymore access or not access. The big divide is because literally at this point, uh, the large majority of people have access to internet and it's, also, it's almost saturation in many countries and those who are not connected through their homes, like in many African or Latin American countries, they are uh, connected through internet cafes, uh, schools, uh, workplaces, etc. The most important divide in the actual use of internet these days is age. Is age. A large proportion of people who are over 60, let's say, don't uh, practice the internet in, in developing countries. In places like Germany or, or the United States or England, certainly they also they are internet users. But in most cases, in the, the These, these billions that are still missing, most of it is not linked to lack of possible connectivity, is lack is fundamentally age. So it's and, not the, and this is, I always say, when I will be gone, my generation will be gone, will be no problem of digital divide in terms of uh, internet use. Uh, it will be a problem of, um, of um, other problems than access. You know, one important thing about this is that the most significant divide is the cultural and educational divide. Because the moment we are all connected to the internet, the ability to know what to do with this connection, how to access resources, how to use these resources to develop your own life, your own project, which is ultimately education, uh, this is what becomes the most important divide. So what internet does, it reproduces and expands the most significant divide that has been all over history, education. The level of education determines what people can do or not with the internet. And we have studies in the schools that show that children from um, poor families, um, uh, you introduce internet in the school, these children do even worse. Children of middle class families with internet in the school, they do much better. Why? Because they have the cultural resources to actually use the internet for anything they want. While the poor children with no background uh, of education in their families, they ultimately use it for games, for playing without any access, not only to education, but to a broader exploration of the wall of information. So if uh, the divide is age, for example, it's not the access, um, because there was, there was one question here that said, is the struggle for power different in the global north and the global south? And by what I listen to you right now, you would say no, it's not? No, the, let's say the, the most important difference there 
is in terms of the quality of the connection, the quality of the access. Not, as we used to say, in terms of the capacity to access the internet. The global south, the large majority of the population has access to the internet. But what the quality of access and what to do with this access is what is different from the highly developed countries in which the education system allows people to understand and process information. Um, you said that education is the answer. Um, and one question here refers to that, and the question goes, so who provides the education? Well, the, in principle, uh, the schools in every society are the institutions that provide the education. The problem is that schools are still based on a very old pedagogy, not only technology, pedagogy, in which uh, um, are determined on the basis of the authority of the teacher and the programs that are marked by uh, educational bureaucracies rather than by the pedagogy that internet would allow, which is the ability for children to develop their own ideas and their own explorations guided and supported by the teachers. And, and the issue is that uh, the freedom of exploration is not part of most of the programs of the educational system. So that is where the problem is. Uh, we uh, did, a, in Catalonia, we did a comprehensive study of all the primary and secondary schools. And what we found is that uh, the school system was such that teachers at home would use the internet. Children at home would use the internet, but not in the school, because it was not part not only the technical part, but the, the use of internet in the school was not made possible by the type of organization, both institutional and intellectual, in terms of the content of the, of the programs. I have a very simple question. Um, we're talking about power and counterpower, social movements, um, negotiation, negotiating power. So what is it that keeps us as a social and digital society together? What is the kind of glue between us in a digital age? Oh, simple question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, fundamentally, the sharing of values, the sharing of values, and the tolerance to share these values. In other words, if uh, we have different systems of uh, evaluation life, uh, different systems uh, between what produces equality or not in society. If we do not agree on some fundamental principles, sharing these principles and making sure that everybody accepts the idea that are being translated into practice, then there is a breakdown of the basic social solidarity. For instance, uh, the European Union is largely disintegrating. Uh, the most important thing is that the European Union, when everything went all right, and there was no major crisis, uh, well, people accepted uh, some solidarity mechanism. Let's say, taking the typical example, uh, Germans helping Greek. Uh, but when things are different, when the, the, the issue is that there are scarce resources, then if people who are not like us uh, don't deserve support. And therefore, the mechanism of support, help, and solidarity break down. Well, what, what is easy to observe between Germany and Greece is also within each country, within Greece, within Germany. When the situation is such that people need support, they only, they only support those who they consider to be like themselves. And that's one a major issue here, is that this is a rule that could apply to very ethnically, socially homogeneous, cohesive societies, but it doesn't work in multicultural, multi-class, multi-racial societies, which are most of the European societies nowadays. And therefore, the, uh, the ability to accept common codes of behavior is being challenged by the practice of social inequality. In 
Germany is better in that sense, but overall, the entire European countries, like the United States, are reaching staggering levels of economic and social inequality. And therefore, this dilutes social cohesion because on the idea that everybody agrees on some basic principles is betrayed by the observation that uh, those who have power and resources have increasingly more power and resources and do not care about the, the weaker segments of the population. So it's a process of social fragmentation which is amplified by the internet, and that's my point in relationship to the internet, because if um, because through the internet, everybody has access to information and has access to what's happening and can debate and can organize discussions in the social networks about the reasons for the inequality and the injustices in society. So in a society in which there is consensus, internet reinforces consensus. In a society in which there's increasing inequality and increasing cleavages between the population and increasing conflicts, internet amplifies uh, these conflicts and therefore contributes to disintegrating social cohesion. Okay, we have like five minutes left um, and there are like 120 questions left, so let's choose some of them. Um, there's one question about um, post-digital society. How could a post-digital society look? Mad Max or Blade Runner? Hmm. I don't remember the films can too you well. Can you repeat? How could a post-digital society oh. look? And it refers to the two films, Mad Max or Blade Runner, and I don't remember them too well, so we, can't, we just have to cut out this kind of reference. So what is a post-digital world like? Well, I don't, I never, frankly, I never uh, talk about the future because it's, uh, it's methodologically it's impossible, seriously. But I don't want to escape the, the question in terms of the, um, which, is, which kind of futures can be imagined. Um, I would not call it post-digital because um, digital is a system of communication which is there to stay forever. Uh, will be m deeper and more complex and more extensive forms of digital communication. Last, as we cannot say that what happened in a post-electricity society, we will have electricity that manages everything. Uh, but the issue, I think, is another one. It's, it's about what, which kind of new forms of social existence are being formed. Well, the easy answer is uh, the new institutions and new forms of social existence is those that will be constructed and developed by the humans in terms of their own societies. And that ultimately will be determined in terms of power relationships, in terms of who, and the negotiations between those who exercise power and those who exercise counterpower, as always has been in history. But if we see now, in the, following this methodology, if we see the, the current connections, what we observe is an in, the more we develop our technological capacity, the more we observe a huge gap between our technological power and our capacity to live together, and our capacity to tolerate each other, and our capacity to correct injustices and to correct uh, inequalities, institutionally speaking. And so, uh, we are moving, we have been moving the last 10 years, and we continue to move toward in an increasingly violent, conflicted world. Among other things, because we are all related in the planet now, the so-called globalization is simply a networking of all the global networks in every domain of life. We are together, but we are separated by religion, by ethnicity, by institutions, by democratic institutions, by class, by levels of development, and we do not have the mechanism to negotiate these dramatic conflicts because the nation states are defenders of their own interests and not defenders of the overall interests of humanity, and the United Nations has never been 
anything else but the expression of the power of the network of the nation states themselves. So the gap between our technological capacity and our institutional and moral capacity to manage the problems is increasing. And the worst possible scenario is how to uh, unleash this incredible technological power we have, for instance, transforming human nature per se. And the weak ethical and institutional capacity to move toward a common well-being rather toward the specific interests of groups who are the most powerful. This is the issue. So at the end, let's come back to um, the focus of the series, which is a European focus. And um, we talked about it in the introduction, in the talk. Um, do you think we should develop a specifically European perspective on digital society? Mm -hmm. And what could it be made of? No, it, it's, it's uh, I, frankly, I, I, to start with, I don't think it's such a thing as Europe, to start saying. Uh, the, the, and that's my latest book, uh, published a week ago, is, is called The Crisis of Europe, and shows why the European Union is disintegrating. Brexit is only the beginning. Uh, the ideal of a united Europe, of a sharing project of Europe, was a wonderful idea that I always supported as a person, as a citizen. But what we observe is the contrary, is the fracturing of Europe and the inability of Europe to act as one single entity. And one other thing, because we do not have a common European identity. What has been common in Europe? Let's be serious. The only thing common in Europe has been killing each other for several hundred years, including the 20th century. That's a sad observation. But so the idea of creating a European project requires developing a common practice, a common practice of being Europeans, with things like uh, uh, shared labor market, shared cultural and educational institutions, shared media systems. But the only thing we have common in Europe is what we have with the rest of the world, which is uh, precisely the uses of internet. Now, the European Union does have a, a somewhat a joint internet policy. So some forms of economic and technological policy can be European. That, that would be the perspective, but not the digital society, because the digital society in an extremely diverse social situation as is the case of Europe, has different expressions and different forms. But Europe does have some commonality in terms of the internet-related digital policies. Which commonality? There is a much stronger emphasis on the public interest than, for instance, in the United States. There is somewhat more protection of privacy and of citizens' rights in Europe. So there are a number of things in the values of Europe, which are widely accepted in the population, which make it for a more humane and decent form of entering a new technological age. No question about that. And that would be, some, to some extent, the superiority of Europe over other areas and, and, and nations in the world. So in that sense, a European perspective is European um, is the attempt to have a control of the technological transformation closer to the values and interests of people's lives. Okay. So you're an optimist and a pessimist at the same time. That's life. <laughs> We have come to our last part of the evening, and this last part is called The Quest. And it's a questionnaire, and it will be the same questionnaire for every guest of the series. And of course, we hope for different answers from everyone. Or no answer. Or no answer at all, that's possible as well. And short answers, of course. And this is how it works. I start the sentence, and you finish it. No. <laughs> I don't play games. It's, it's science, it's a questionnaire. 
Yeah, okay. Well, you made the questionnaire, but I cannot answer the questionnaire. Okay. okay. We will see if you don't like the question, you don't answer. If you like it, you answer. Okay? No, because I don't like the method. You don't like the method. How, what is your method? The method is what you just expressed. No. Okay. Particularly without, pre without previous warning. Hmm? Yeah. Ah. That should we be thought the, it should be some, that, some that spontaneous thing. That should be the invitation thing. later. No, no, that should be in the sponta yeah. spontaneous. No, I have been spontaneous the whole evening. That's but, true. Uh, yeah, but uh, you are not being spontaneous. That is, your questions are not spontaneous. So why should give spontaneous answers to non-spontaneous questions? That's a good question. First, it's, 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 it's not you, safe, the, but it's a game. I, I may ask you the questions, and then you respond, and then we discuss Oh, my it. God. <laughs> this is like... Let's try the first one, okay? Because this is a fun one. If I had the chance to reinvent the internet, I would. This is our problem. That's not a question that I raise for myself, or I have never heard this question. We're entering like the realm of, of fantasy and power, and you have the power to do everything you want within that question. But I don't, so okay. I cannot imagine. <laughs> So thank you. Sorry about that, because I have great respect for you. But Everything's this fun. kind of TED Talk gimmicks, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a wonderful person and moderator and everything. But I, I, we can have a drink together rather than trying to, to answer these questions. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam, for your we, work. We, of course, want to thank you that uh, you oh, are you're here you're still giving me gifts after yeah, that? of course. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> we thank are you. happy you're here, and um, we wanted to give you a present from Berlin. And since we are not exactly a wine region, and we cannot compete with great Spanish wines, this is a little, like, foodie package, little things, nice things to eat from Berlin. And uh, thank you very much for being here and coming. Thank you very much. For your understanding. <laughs> so, you're very much invited uh, to stay here for a drink. And the next chance to get more of the European perspective is um, the 30th of January. Our next guest will be Christoph Neuberger, a communicational scientist and professor, and we would be very happy to see you again. And right now, because we have so many questions left, you ask. You, of course, you can stay for a drink outside there at the Panorama Bar and have a real live chat with us and with Manuel Castells. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you.